Welcome back, Controls Champions, to another episode of the PLC Programming Cookbook. I'm your host, John Breen, and today we're going to be talking about the kind of sequence structure I use almost all the time. You may have noticed in the last couple sequences that I've gone over, I've said, hey, this one's kind of limited by size and this one doesn't scale very well, things like that. Well, this structure, I think, fixes all of that. I think it's easy to use. I think it's easy to understand. It's easy to program. And like I say, it scales well. So most of this is going to look pretty similar to what we've already gone over. Again, we've got a conveyor. This, this is exactly the same. We're pretending to control the same virtual machine here. Uh, a conveyor that comes down that gives us boxes. It puts boxes in the spot here. And then a pusher pushes it on to the next task. Maybe that's a, a reject or maybe that's another conveyor, what have you. And the system won't run until we push the start button. Okay, so that's the basic function. The variables that we have here are very similar to the very first thing that we talked about. There's a permissive and this just represents, you know, safety circuits and air pressure switches and whatever. Um, we've got a dwell is just when we push this, I want it to hold for two seconds so that you can see that this indicator comes on. And then the rest of this is what the sequence runs on, step, ready, and active. So I'm using the same things in this sequence as well. <clears throat> step, ready, and active. Now, the big difference is how I use the step, really. In this first example that I gave you, step was broken out into bits. So we set bit zero, and then we set bit one, and we set bit two, and these bits stay on as we go through the process. And so, like I say, that doesn't scale very well. First because we run out of bits at 32 and then we would have to have another dent. Second, it would be really nice to have spaces between all these bits and that'll make us run out even faster. So how do we solve that? Well, instead of using the dent like a collection of bits, why don't we use it as an actual number? It's an integer. It can be huge, you know, some thousands or millions it can, it can count up to. So why not use that number that's a collection of those bits? instead of just the bits themselves. And that's exactly what we're doing. So this permissive run, ready, ready, start push button, this is all the same as that other sequence. So I'm not gonna talk about it, these top two rungs. So let's just talk about what is actually going on in the sequence. When the sequence is active, it's true for all of these steps, I'll just ignore it from here on out. We want to go to, uh, we want to say, okay, what step are we in? So we use an equals block. If step equals zero, then do this thing. And you'll see that pattern repeats. If step equals zero, 10, 20. Now, why am I counting up by tens? Well, there's that first thing that I said where it's nice to have a space in case you decide you need an intermediate step. I can put nine intermediate steps here. So. Uh, plenty of room for expansion and growth and uh, filling in blank spaces where I forgot to put something. Um, to be honest with you, I'm OCD enough that after I've gone through a project and I've debugged it and started it up, and I may have some you know fives and sevens and whatever in here, I usually do go back and set it all to tens again. Um, and that may just be because I'm OCD. Uh, I think it makes it look a little prettier for the next guy. It looks like a complete product that way rather than uh, looking like something that's already gone through the maintenance cycle a few times. Um, but not necessary. It's not necessary at all. So uh, at the beginning we say, okay, we're in step zero. I'm gonna wait for the box to be present. And once the box is present, I'm gonna move 10 into step. So then as the sequence scans here, it's gonna find step 10 and step 10 is going to fire this output, push or extend. So that's gonna extend this to push the box. And after the pusher is extended all the way, we've got a switch here, it's an input. After that's true, then we go to step 20. And when we're at step 20, then we're gonna wait two seconds. We've got a timer here, we're watching the output of that timer. This Q, if you're uh, more familiar with like Alan Bradley, where they have a done bit Q, 
queue is the same thing. It's the done bit. It means it's done timing for two seconds. Two seconds has elapsed in this condition. So after we've been extended for two seconds, like I say, two seconds out this way, just so we can see that light up in our simulation, then we're gonna go to step 30. And in step 30, guess what? We're gonna be retracting the pusher. We're gonna be bringing it back this way. And after it's retracted all the way, we see that switch move to step 40. And step 40 only exists to reset the sequence. We go back to step zero. So let's run this once. I'll go online with my simulated PLC. Note that I've already set the permissive bit. Again, this is uh, in a real world situation. This would be representing guard switches, etc. So we don't have anything really there. Click on the start button. And notice that uh, our sequence is now active. It's waiting for a box to be present. Active, we're in step zero waiting for a box to be present. So I give it a box, it does its thing. We see this pushing and you can see this number. It's all over the place, this step number. You can see it count up. So we're at 10, 20, 30, and back to zero. 40 happened so fast you didn't see it. This is one of the things I like about this, uh, this structure. I've already talked about how I can count up by tens, so there's a lot of room in between every step. I also like that there can be a bajillion steps. I've never even come close to running out of steps and, and had to create another tag like I would have to with, uh, with this setting bits method. And it's also visible everywhere. I know exactly what step the sequence is in anywhere here because there, it, it's everywhere in the code. And so that number just pops up and it says, yep, you're in 10, you're in 20, you're in 30, whatever it is. And obviously, you know, the, the screen update rate in my eyeball isn't always fast enough to figure out what's going on with that. But especially if it's stuck or, or you have a process like this that's kind of nice and slow and methodical, you can see what's going on very readily and that helps you understand more than fits on the screen here. So I can be looking at the last step and know that it's on the first step right now, step zero. And obviously this is a very small program, but uh, many real world programs are a lot bigger than this. You can have, you know, tens or hundreds of steps. Of course, uh, my personal argument, if you have hundreds of steps, maybe you should consider chunking some of those down into smaller uh, sequences. But that's a topic for another day. So what else can you do with this? Well, you'd probably have a stop button in the real world, a, a red button. So now that we're out of simulation mode, if I was going to add a stop button, I might do that here. So maybe I would add a normally closed contact here and I'd put a stop button there and it would look something like that. So we can start, this latches itself on and then if I ever push the stop button, okay, uh, we're out of active again and now we have to push the start button to be able to go again. So I think it's kind of funny that I've spent probably the least amount of time talking about uh, this, again, as my favorite, uh, usually go-to sequence structure, but I wanted to go through the other couple sequences that I have because I think they're probably more common and uh, it, it's hard to talk about the limitations and how this one improves upon them without having those examples. So if you haven't seen them, do go back and watch them. It'll help your understanding of how sequences work in general. It'll help your pattern matching, your, your pattern recognition. When you're out there in the field looking at unfamiliar programs, you'll notice that people use all these different structures. You'll see them everywhere. So it's well worth your time, I think, to look through all of the sequence types that I've uh, demonstrated, even if you plan on just using the one every time you write a program. So I hope you find that useful. If you do, please give it a thumbs up. Give me a comment. Let me know what you liked about it the most. 
Um, if there's something I can do better for you, leave me a comment for that too. As always, I'm doing this for you. I want it to be helpful and I can do a better job at that if you're giving me feedback. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thanks for watching. If there's one thing I like more than making these videos, it's hearing what you have to say about them. So um, leave a comment, share, like, or subscribe. Ooh.